The history of the Earth has been colourful as today's Earth is rather different than it was in its beginning. For example, the atmosphere of the Earth did not have the oxygen and carbon dioxide concentrations it has today. Oxygen was added to the atmosphere by photosynthesizing plants and they needed carbon dioxide in the first place to photosynthesize. Therefore, they could not have been the ones to start off life. Autotrophs created their own energy yielding molecules such as glucose. Heterotrophs don't and instead consume autotrophs. Since autotrophs could not have carried out photosynthesis without carbon dioxide, heterotrophs must have been the ones who evolved first. This is known as the heterotroph hypothesis. Most heterotrophs today, including humans, consume autotrophs. So what did the early heterotrophs consume? They consumed the chemicals themselves, the initial building blocks of organic life. Sources of these molecules could have been lightning, UV radiation and heat. The initial protocell would have collected organic molecules and natural selection would have resulted in its ability to extract energy from ATP. Then the protocell could divide and reproduce itself. On early Earth, the pre-existing biological materials present today, such as seeds, organic matter, oil and others, were not available. The simplest classification system of bacteria is based on their shape and arrangement. Bacteria come in sphere, rod, spiral, comma and filament shapes and can be paired up in twos, strings or 3D shapes. Amongst bacteria, the cell wall composition is a key determinant of what type they belong to. This is important in terms of predicting their response to various antibiotics. Based on different bacteria species response to crystal violet stain, gram-positive bacteria are able to take up the stain and appear violet under a microscope, while gram-negative bacteria do not take up the stain and will appear pink if a counter stain is added after washing off the crystal violet stain. Iodine is added after the stain in order to bind to it and trap it inside the bacteria. Acetone is used in the decolorization step. Any free stain is washed off. In gram-positive bacteria, the stain persists. The difference arises because different bacteria have different cell walls. The bacterial cell wall is one of the main targets of antibiotics. Notice the difference in thickness of the murin layer in gram-positive versus gram-negative cells. This layer is what absorbs the violet stain. Hence, gram-positive bacteria turn violet, while gram-negative bacteria lose the stain upon washing. Penicillin is an antibiotic used against gram-positive bacteria. It doesn't work on gram-negative bacteria because their outer membrane protects against it. Penicillin works by interfering with the production of the cell wall component murin, and as gram-positive bacteria have so much of it and at the outer surface, losing it kills them off. Gram-negative bacteria have much less murin and an outer membrane, so penicillin doesn't interfere with their function. There are many different classes of antibiotics, some of which do work against both types of bacteria, for example by interfering with DNA synthesis. Mosses are simple plants with no differentiated parts such as leaves, stems or roots. They are multicellular and do not possess a cuticle or stomata except in the spore forming parts. Their features are adapted to moist conditions and vulnerable in dry conditions. Rhizoids are specialized for attachment to the soil. They do not penetrate deeply, so mosses only populate areas where water and ions are abundant higher in the soil. Since bryophytes do not possess a vascular system, the structural support 
is given solely by the turga pressure inside cells. The capsule contains spores that disperse to give rise to further plants. Spores germinate in moist conditions and can withstand a limited amount of desiccation. This renders them vulnerable in dry areas. Mosses are therefore restricted to moist areas. Unlike mosses, ferns have differentiated parts, such as true roots, stems and leaves. They are therefore better adapted to terrestrial life and possess cuticles and stomata that enable better water retention. They also possess a vascular system with xylem vessels and others. Structural support is given by both turga in cells and the woody xylem vessels alongside other structures found in the vascular bundle. Some leaves on the front are sterile, while others develop reproductive structures called sori. Sori are found as multiple circular structures on the underside of the reproductive fronds and contain the spores within structures called sporangia. Despite the many improved adaptations to terrestrial life compared to mosses, the fern spores are also susceptible to damage through desiccation in dry conditions. They germinate in moist conditions and are partially resistant to desiccation. Flatworms like the liver fluke are bilaterally symmetrical and flattened dorsoventrally. This means they are flat back to front. Their bilateral symmetry means they are identical when split into two, lengthways in this case. They have a single opening, the mouth, to the gut. Its flat body tissues support its body structure with no specialised skeletal system. Many flatworm species are parasitic. They do not have an internal body cavity, circulation and respiratory systems, but do have a brain in the sense of a more concentrated neural network in the front part of their body, that is the head. The flatworm lives in water or wet environments such as leaf litter and has its flattened body in order to maximise diffusion across its body. The minimised diffusion pathway ensures it is quick enough to enable good gas exchange. Having no anus, they regurgitate food as part of digestion and hence cannot undergo a continuous process of digesting food. Earthworms are also bilaterally symmetrical like flatworms, but instead of being flat, they are round in transverse section or widthways, as well as being segmented metamerically. Metamers are repeating sections in an organism that have the same structure, although may accomplish different functions based on their tissue distribution and specialization. For example, the gut is specialized between the metamers and the earthworm has both a mouth and an anus for continuous digestion. A hydrostatic skeleton is present, formed from the body cavities of each segment. The prostomium is the first segment starting at the head. The clitellum is the egg storing structure near the head, while setae are hair-like structures on the earthworm's surface. The key characteristic of all animals is movement. They achieve this in many different ways. Microscopic organisms, such as bacteria, have a flagellum that they can wiggle to propel themselves. Spiders use passive movement whenever they glide downwards. Mammals self-propel to crawl, walk and run. Aquatic organisms have fins to move underwater. Birds use wings to fly through the air. There are more specific intermediate types of movement, such as gliding, soaring, jumping and climbing. Some insects can jump very high in the air. Parasites are transported by their host, an indirect method of transportation that can nonetheless be very powerful. In order to have locomotion, animals evolved structures that could support the added pressure of navigating terrestrial environments, the water, the air, 
and others. These come in the form of external or internal skeletons. Evolution could happen evenly over time or in bursts. The latter option is called punctuated equilibrium. Darwin's perspective was that of evolution as a continuous process over time, but Elridge and Gold proposed the theory of punctuated equilibrium. Diagrams and cladograms are used to show the relationships between species over time. This shows whether they have diverged from a common ancestor, continued in parallel, or converged from different ancestors. As populations accrue different adaptations, their evolutionary journey can be graphed. This reveals patterns of evolution, stabilising, directional, or disruptive. Stabilising selection brings individuals closer to the mean of the population. This could show beak length, for example. Directional selection brings individuals away from the mean in a new direction. The genome is the entirety of genetic material carried by an individual or species and varies accordingly. The database of genomes of different species is growing and includes humans. Simple genomes, such as those of viruses, can enable a relatively straightforward effort of assigning proteins to each gene in the genome, and thus creating a database of them. This is known as a proteome. The information gleaned from a virus proteome, for example, can inform vaccination targets by selecting appropriate antigens such as elements of the viral capsid. Other exciting synthetic biology applications can be explored, such as glowing beer, synthesizing specific compounds useful in medicine, or manufacturing using organisms to whom that product is a native in an attempt to boost production or create new products. Analyzing and storing information about more complex genomes is hindered by non-coding DNA and regulatory genes. Non-coding DNA and regulatory genes take up the vast majority of this type of genome. If we have obtained a DNA sample or a few, what next? Well, nothing much can be done with that. We must obtain exponentially more DNA to use for any purpose. And it all, of course, must be identical. We must essentially clone our DNA. Considered the very staple of molecular biology, this technique for multiplying DNA many-fold was invented by Carrie Mullis. Essentially, the DNA is denatured, so the two strands break apart. Short complementary bits, called primers, attach to the strands. The enzyme DNA polymerase binds to the primers and initiates the assembly of a new DNA strand. And finally, the process is repeated many times in a chain reaction. This is the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. Soon enough, the few bits of DNA become thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions. In vivo, or inside a living organism, gene cloning involves stimulating bacteria to take up target DNA by inserting it in a circular bit of DNA they normally carry beside their main DNA, called a plasmid. This is often transferred horizontally between bacteria and always passed down through the generations. Target DNA may be inserted in plasmids via PCR when restriction endonuclease leaves sticky ends which can be joined back. Plasmids also contain an antibiotic resistance gene, which, if taken up successfully by bacteria, will enable their growth on a medium containing that antibiotic. This allows the selection of only bacteria which have taken up the plasmid, and with it, our DNA of interest. The host cells can now be grown on a large scale. They will express the new DNA in the plasmid and pass it on to their offspring cells to do the same. Shortly, 
there will be a massive number of bacteria producing whatever the gene of interest codes for. This could be human insulin. The product can then be isolated and used. It is a pure form and it is in fact being used worldwide to treat type 1 diabetes. This breakthrough enabled better management of the condition, which had previously been treated with non-human insulin, which had side effects. Recombinant DNA technology can bring with it new ethical, financial and social issues. For example, some people decide to patent basic DNA, such as that of certain crops, and charge farmers to grow these crops. In medicine, gene-based treatments can also be severely restricted financially. The interest of people who want to extort new technology for their immediate profit results in a huge burden of treatment cost to patients or national health services. Social issues include genetic modification of plants, animals and human embryos. The ability to pick or remove various traits associated with key concerns in society, such as appearance, function and diversity, can pose conundrums. Three parent babies, GM food, heritable deafness as a disease or valid option belonging to a strong community and culture. Many plant species and some animal species have ways of cloning themselves. For example, plant cuttings can be used to propagate a plant without requiring its seeds. Bacteria undergoing binary fission essentially clone themselves as part of asexual reproduction. Animals can be cloned by breaking up embryonic cells into multiple groups. Commercial uses for cloning farm animals and pets have been established. Ethical concerns exist for cloning humans due to identity and family questions. Natural human cloning occurs in identical twins. Lab cloning would use the adult cells of someone much older or potentially deceased, which raises many legal, social and personal issues that have led countries to prohibit human cloning. Okay, so we have our glorious sample, or microorganism, or whatever that we're about to grow. We grow it using special media such as LB or lysogeny broth for bacteria and YPD or yeast extract peptone dextrose for yeast. These media contain basic nutrients like sugars and amino acids and encourage microorganisms to thrive. They can be formulated into liquid form and incubated in flasks or into gel form and incubated in petri dishes. Selective media exist that specifically stimulate or inhibit a certain type of microorganism, making it easier to identify and isolate what we are growing. Microorganisms need an energy source such as chemicals and light, as well as the raw materials to make biological products. They can be capable of constructing all the products needed, such as carbohydrates and proteins, from a simple pool of chemicals. Some species may need additional compounds for their metabolic activity. These can be fatty acids or vitamins and are added to their basic nutrient mix. Depending on the experiment or application, extra compounds must be added to the growth medium. Affinity chromatography is the specific type of chromatography used in molecular biology research as it enables the separation of given proteins from mixtures of bacterial cell lysates, buffers and others. The concept of affinity is that some specific property of the target protein, such as size, presence of tags previously added for this purpose, or chemical bonding including hydrogen bonding, disulfide bridges or ionic interactions, can be used to bind it to a stationary phase, while compounds that do not meet that criteria can be washed away. The protein can then be eluted into a solution that contains the target protein only, resulting in its purification from the original mixture. In order to preserve the chemical environment for each step, different buffers are used for loading, washing and eluting. A common binding tag used to separate proteins is a his tag, which consists of six histidine amino acids joined together. It can be genetically engineered into any DNA 
that codes for the target protein. Therefore, the protein will be synthesized with an extra part, the his tag, at the start or end of its sequence. The his tag can then be used to bind the target protein to the stationary phase and separate it from all the other proteins in the mixture without the tag using a nickel column. You can see it's a nickel column just by its blue colour. Purification columns for chromatography come in many shapes and sizes. The smaller ones can be used for small volumes, while the largest ones are used in conjunction with automatic pumping machines. Manual use involves passing the original mixed solution with the target protein through the column, followed by washing the column multiple times with a special buffer to remove the unwanted components. Lastly, and the most critical step, is elution. This washes away the bound target protein from the column in a yet another specialized buffer where it can be stored for longer in its purified medium. Alternatively, all the buffers can be pre-made and used with an automated machine. In metabolic pathways, reaction rates can be determined by the relative concentration of substrates and products of a reaction or series of reactions. The substrate presence can drive the reactions to continue for as long as there is substrate available, or alternatively the reactions could continue for as long as the product is being removed in order to maintain a constant level. Feedback inhibition is when the presence of a threshold amount of product signals the reaction to halt. This is also known as end product inhibition. Inhibitors are molecules which interfere with the substrate binding to the active site of an enzyme, slowing down or stopping the reaction. These may be reversible or non-reversible inhibitors. The reversible inhibitors can be competitive or non-competitive. Biofarming, or bio-PH farming, for pharmaceuticals, describes the practice of genetically engineering animals to produce foreign products of interest to humans. Instead of conventional farming, where the natural products of animals are harvested, such as eggs, milk or wool, biofarming involves the harvesting of new products from genetically modified animals that would not naturally produce them. By genetically modifying a goat egg, for example, the gene for human antithrombin can be incorporated into the goat genome. The kids, or goat offspring, where this modification has been successful, are bred further. This can be tested by seeing if their milk contains the target product, antithrombin. Thrombin promotes blood coagulation, and in people at risk can lead to harmful blood clots. Therefore, antithrombin can help prevent blood clots. Communicable disease spreads from affected individuals to those unaffected. Pathogens are microorganisms which can cause disease. These include bacteria, viruses and fungi. Pathogens can cause disease when they invade the interface between an organism and their environment. This could be someone's skin, lungs or digestive system. There are multiple ways in which pathogens cause disease. Bacteria can produce toxins. Viruses take over cellular machinery such as enzymes and nutrients and destroy the cells in the process, while fungi can secrete enzymes that break down host tissue. There are many different kinds of bacterial toxin, for example by Staph aureus, such as protein barrels that integrate into the plasma membrane of host cells and cause their contents to leak out through these huge pores. Parasites are symbiotic species that rely on their host for nutrients like predators rely on prey. This is at the expense of the host which often suffers illness as a result or a damaged reproductive function. Unlike predators that have a lower reproductive capacity compared to their prey, parasites have a higher reproductive potential than their host. An ecological niche is the set of tolerances and requirements a species has in its immediate living space. For example, 
Birds make use of a tree's branches to house nests, while fungi make use of a tree's trunk to grow. The same habitat can have many different niches that can be populated by different species. Parasites have very narrow niches because they are specific to their host. Human head lice cannot survive anywhere except the human scalp. This also means that the molecular processes that parasites rely on in their host are very similar and overlap with those of their host. One reason developing effective treatments against them is challenging. This interdependence means that some processes carried out by the host on behalf of its parasite renders the parasite degenerate or unable to fulfill them by itself. Training is a key factor that determines aerobic fitness and it has the power to significantly improve it. The FITT factors of the exercise program regulate the fitness outcome. These are frequency, intensity, type and time. The type of activity could be running, cycling, team sports or others, while the frequency, intensity and time spent doing it increase as the aerobic fitness improves. A guideline starting program might be 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise three times a week. More specific measures of intensity for aerobic exercise include the percentage of target heart rate to be exercised. For example, exercising 120 beats per minute out of a target of 140 beats per minute would be equivalent to an 86% intensity. Keeping track of the progress of exercise in aerobic fitness can be done by monitoring resting heart rate, breathing rate and recovery time. Supplementation for the purpose of enhancing athlete performance can be undertaken in many ways. One of them is blood doping, which involves increasing the amount of red blood cells available in the blood to improve oxygen availability and delivery to cells. One method is taking an athlete's own blood and storing it for later transfusion. Another method is taking recombinant human erythropoietin, which is a hormone that stimulates additional red blood cell production in the body. Blood doping has been banned in order to allow for fair competitions in endurance sports. Some steroids are also banned. Steroids are a class of small chemicals that play key roles in metabolism and health, for example the sex hormones testosterone and estrogen. Some steroids, testosterone included, are banned or regulated because they can have effects pertaining to athletic performance. Analogues and chemicals not normally present in the human body can also be used for this purpose. These varying chemicals have different effects, and some are more dangerous than others. The response to steroids can be very different between individuals. Another supplementation strategy is carbohydrate loading. This is done by very high endurance athletes, such as those running or playing sports for more than 60-90 minutes. Carb loading involves eating a large amount of carbohydrate-rich foods in order to maintain and increase the glycogen stores in the body. Before the endurance event, athletes decrease the amount of training undertaken to prevent glycogen depletion. And welcome back. These were just a few of hundreds of topics on the A-Level Biologist, your hub.